Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at CrossFit Auto Body, located in Union City. CrossFit Auto Body is the perfect place to begin your fitness journey. Come in and become part of the CrossFit community. Visit uccrossfitautobody.com for more information. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, where every single week we explore the people, the culture, and the history of our home right here in West Tennessee, just like we do every day here at our Museum and Heritage Park, Discovery Park of America. I'm your host, Scott Williams, and I'm so excited to have on this episode, Dr. Larry DeLucas, a real-life astronaut. Tell me a little bit about where you're from, what your parents did, what kind of family you grew up in. Originally from Syracuse, New York. My dad um, was a prisoner of war in World War II. He then uh, came back and ended up graduating from Syracuse University and went uh, and uh, started working in Social Security. In order to, if you're doing well, in order to, uh, uh, you know, get a promotion in Social Security, I think it's still that way. You have to move. You can't stay in the same office. So from the time I started kindergarten, Until I graduated high school, we moved 13 times. Wow. Unfortunately, my father was very good. And the last move was where I live now, Birmingham, Alabama. Okay. And and the reason that was the last one is that's the payment center for the entire Southeast. And my father became director there. Yeah. So he he did well. But anyway, um, so I learned, you know, how to make friends quickly in schools. I cried every time we had to move because uh, I was on the basketball team and the baseball ball team and I never could start and finish in one school almost, you know, so, so, but I did get to spend two and a half years in high school in Pennsylvania before we moved next to Georgia. Um, and so that was the longest I think I ever stayed in a school. Yeah. I don't hear much of a Southern accent. Yeah. No, no, no. no. And I have, uh, I have, uh, an older brother, um, who everyone thought would be the one to go to space. He, he, um, uh, you know the SAT, the, the Scholastic, uh, Scholastic. Sure. and so my older brother made a perfect score on it. He then took the advanced math and physics, made perfect scores on those. He goes and uh, and gets accepted at MIT. Um, ended up in aeronautical engineering. Oh, graduated. Wow. Um, I think he ended up second in his class. And he's a physician today. Oh, I was going to ask you <laughs> so, so, if he was in theater. Go figure, <laughs> go figure you know. Yeah. And so uh, I was the athlete at that time in the family. And my dad would always say, why can't you be like your older brother? Because every minute of his life, he read books. And that's why he did so well. Well, and, I was going to ask, uh, to what do you think, to what do you attribute you and your brother's success? What did your parents do um, at home? to get you guys to study so much. And to- they didn't have to do anything to my older brother. Mm-hmm. Um, he just loved to read. Um, I would always get so upset because we had to wash the dishes after we ate dinner together as a family. And he always went in the bathroom and didn't come out till it was all done. <laughs> and he was in there reading a book, <laughs> you know, to show you the kind of, he was so, and, and the bo- little boy that I just got interviewed by, um, you know, he, he asked me, what it takes to be an astronaut. Yeah, why don't you tell that story real quick? And it it was amazing. I'm walking upstairs uh, to the top floor to look at some of the space exhibits. And this young boy, I think he was about nine, 10 years old. And uh, he comes up and said, are you an astronaut? And I said, well, I was. And so he asked me what mission I flew on. And I told him, and he he seemed like he was familiar with that mission. (laughs) But anyway, uh, you know, I I told him, read books if you want to be an astronaut, because they look for people that are well-rounded. And, and I said, in terms of what you end up pursuing as a career in school, you know, in college, I said, it really doesn't matter too much. It has to be either engineering or a science field. But but I said, they're going to care very much when they interview you, you know, that you, you're well-rounded in all areas. Uh, they'll even ask you what kind of books you like to read in your spare time. And boy, he was listening to every word I said. And, and then I told him a story about a student that I had when I was a professor at the university. Uh, this student uh, made straight A's at Georgia Tech in, in computer science came and got a PhD in biochemistry, made straight A's, 
toward the PhD, and then went to work for NASA at Johnson Space Center and um, um, applied to be an astronaut after about four years and couldn't get an interview. Applied two years later and didn't get an interview. And then it was the third time uh, as a woman, she, she met one of the people on the committee and asked, why can't I get an interview? You know, I've done everything. You know, I, I've never made a B. You know, I'm a perfect scorer uh, in everything I've done. And uh, the person said, you've never done any exploration. Mm. You know, yes, you're very bright, but tell me what you do to explore because that's part of, you know, what we do here at NASA. So that summer, she went to the South Pole on, a, I think it was about a two-month journey looking at extremophiles. So I told the student this, and it was almost like he's categorizing, he's putting everything in his head to remember so that he can pursue in the same way and be more successful. Wow. And uh, I did give him some hope at the end in yeah. that, um, you know, with all the companies that are getting into space flights and so forth, it's going to be easier, I think, in the future to get selected because today, especially without the space shuttle, you know, it, 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 there are astronauts that have been working in NASA, and they're already selected as astronauts, but they've never flown. And some of them have had to wait 10 years for their flight because with a Soyuz capsule, one had to be a Russian, one might be a European, and then one American every time. And it only goes every three months. Mm. And so it was difficult. Yeah. You know, but that's all going to change now. And so SpaceX, so I think, will be the first company to be launching astronauts back to the space station. But um, there's several other companies that are right behind. Well, so. someday we may hear a, a young astronaut talking about his inspiration came from his visit to Discovery Park <laughs> Maybe. of America, Maybe. and we'll know that was the kid Maybe. that you talked to. Maybe so. So you were you were a kid like him. Did you know what you wanted had to no, be when you grew up? Had no idea. I had no idea when I started college what I was going to major in. And where did you go to college? Um, so I, uh, all my. Five degrees from UAB, University of Alabama at Birmingham. That's the one with a not so good football team. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, but um, what got me interested in science was a high school uh, chemistry teacher. So in Georgia, I took, ended up taking, you know, chemistry under this, prof uh, it wasn't a professor, but a teacher. Mm -hmm. And the way he taught was kind of unique compared to other people that had taught science to me in the past. He would give us a problem to go home and solve every day. And the next day when we'd come in, he would randomly choose someone, you mm -hmm. know, what do you think is the answer? Mm -hmm. And we had to go kind of look in the library sometimes, try to figure out the answer. And it was fun trying to see if we could, you know, come up with the answer. And I enjoyed that. But then if it was something that was a chemical experiment, he'd demonstrate it and show us the answer. And, you know, he almost blew the ceiling off one time with uh, put it, putting, uh, I think it was cesium in a jar of water. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, um, I just got excited about trying to find out the answer to something you didn't know. And, and, uh, and, and, and I, I ended up taking two full years of chemistry. When I started college, you can clep out uh, of chem. And mm -hmm. I, I took this exam and clepped out of my whole first year. So I actually started in organic chemistry, but I had absolutely no confidence in myself. Um, I couldn't look at someone in their eyes. I was always looking down. I knew I was good at sports, but never did I think I could be a scientist. And uh, when I started in organic chemistry, it was about the second exam that we took. I did well on the first two exams, I think because of that background I already had. But uh, the professor walks up after class and says, would you like to work for me? Because I had done well on a couple tests. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I, I couldn't believe someone would want me to do that. And, uh, you know, then I started working for him part time during the summer. I worked for him full time and um, we started doing experiments and I made some mistakes and he had to be there overseeing it. But pretty soon, you know, not only did he let me kind of set it up and do it on my own, but if I came up with an idea, you know, how we might be able to get, get a better result, he said, go try it. And some of my ideas worked out and he complimented me mm -hmm. and I got more confidence that maybe I could do this. Mm -hmm. And all it takes is having a passion for what you're doing and working really hard. And, and I think, you know, between the high school teacher and that first professor, that's why I stayed in science. 
Um, you know, if you had said to me in high school, what do you want to do when you grow up? I would have told you, because I knew I was too short to be a basketball player mm -hmm. and I couldn't hit a curveball <laughs> real well. Um, I thought I was going to be a coach. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it's really amazing how just a couple, a couple mentors can change, you know, your whole perspective on your life and what you can become. And that's what happened to me. And so I try when I give presentations to children, especially, or even high school students, I have a, a presentation called um, A Career in Science, Expect the Unexpected. And I tell them my whole story. And, you know, I think it, it lets them see that, you know, you don't have to be this person with thick glasses to be a successful scientist. And if you go into science, it's really exciting. And as long as you work hard, you're going to do well. And I, I believe that. And what it, it, it's, it's fascinating that really what you started off with, with, which is, you know, be an explorer, you really lived that out. You know, you're really yes. a great example of yeah. living that out. Um, which is what we're all about here at Discovery Park. At what point did you first become sort of aware that you wanted to apply to become an astronaut? In the ninth grade, I, I built my own telescope. I ground, believe it or not, a 12-inch mirror. It, it, I was the president of our science club, and so it wasn't just me grinding on it. Um, I don't know if you've seen how you do that, but you have to take different grits, and we have this big uh, oil barrel, and we've got the mirror on there, and we're grinding. It took a year. To, to get a nice parabola. Wow. And, uh, and then I sent it off to get it silvered, but then yeah. came back and we put this telescope together. Um, it's and, incredible. And, and so, but if you had said, you know, do you want to be an astronaut again? I had no confidence anyone would ever choose me to be. I, in high school, I was a B student. I wasn't like my older brother. And, you know, I ended up with about a 1350 on the SAT and my older brother makes a 1600. So I always had this feeling I'm not good enough, you know. And it, again, it took teachers to change my mind. But, you know, here's one time when a congressman did something good. Um, senator Howell Heflin was a senator for many years. He's passed away now in Alabama. And he said, we, you know, this is after I became a assistant professor at UAB. Uh, he said, we have all these scientists and engineers, you know, at Marshall Space Flight Center. And we got all these scientists at the university and they never talk and they're only an hour and a half apart. Why don't we have some kind of a, a convention or meeting and let them share their ideas and see if there's something they can do together? And so this scientist at Marshall Space Flight Center holds up a Ziploc bag and in it was a crystal of a salt, not a protein, but a salt. Mm -hmm. But it was as big as my fist. And he said, we grew this in space. And then he showed a couple slides that showed why a crystal growing on Earth ends up not growing as large and ends up with deformities in it due to gravity. And then he showed a picture of a crystal growing in space and why that doesn't happen. And I'm sitting there we have to try this with proteins. And that's what I became, a, it's called a protein crystallographer. Mm. So we crystallize proteins in our body and bacteria and viruses. And then from, from that crystal, we expose it to an X-ray beam, usually at a synchrotron. And the one we usually use now is in Chicago. Um, but anyway, from the diffraction pattern of the X-rays, you can determine where every atom is in that protein within thousands of an angstrom. The problem in this field is getting a high quality crystal because what that crystal is, is hundreds of thousands of copies of that protein all lined up like a row of bricks on a wall and they have to be perfectly aligned in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. and, and if they're not perfectly aligned, when you expose it to x-rays, you don't get good enough data, you can't get the structure. Mm -hmm. So the easy ones were done early in this field and now all the ones that were difficult to get good crystals, that was what's stopping everyone from doing structures of these. And why do we want that structure? Once you see the structure of a protein, it lets you understand how it works in our body, but also we're proteins, pretty much all diseases are based on a protein in your body that's not working right or foreign proteins that enter your body in bacteria or viruses. So once you have the structure of that protein, you can design a drug that's like a key going in a mm -hmm. lock that fits mm -hmm. that one protein mm -hmm. to 
try to minimize side effects. Mm -hmm. And so this whole field became known as structure-based drug design. And and uh, so the, the bottleneck was getting good crystals. And so I knew we've got to try this in space with proteins. And so um, I had to learn Space makes you think differently. Mm -hmm. It's one of the real neat things about trying to do something in space because without gravity, you can't do what you do here on Earth. Right. So on Earth, when we grow a crystal, we have a solution down below in a little well, and we have a droplet hanging upside down over the solution. And it's sealed, mm -hmm. and it pulls water out of the drop. They don't touch, but then eventually, you know, as, the, as it concentrates the protein, if the pH is right, the ionic strength, all these conditions, you get a crystal. And so I had to figure out how to do this in space because in space, that solution down below would crawl right up the wall and touch the drop hmm. because without gravity, there's nothing right. to hold it down. Right. And in space, the attraction of a liquid for a surface dominates everything. Yeah. And so I came up with a, a growing crystals out of the tip of a syringe and the solution that would be down below, you know, these felt pens that mm -hmm. we use, well, that holds on to liquid. Mm -hmm. So I put that down below and mm -hmm. soaked that with the oh. liquid and it held it in okay. space. And so the first experiment, you know, if you have an experiment, and this first one went up in 1985 for me. If you have an experiment on the space shuttle, you get to watch it with the spouses of the astronauts. So you're no one oh. closer except people in bunkers. So you're huh. two and a half miles away. Yeah. And I don't know why I, I've never in my life, even when my parents died, I didn't cry at the funeral. Mm -hmm. I was very sad, but mm -hmm. I, it just, I just don't cry. Yeah. And this thing takes off and you see the fire and smoke, but the sound hasn't reached you yet. And then all of a sudden the ground starts shaking and you get hit right in your chest with the shockwave of the sound. And I started crying. And I turned to my wife and she was crying. There were reporters and television people there, they were crying. And then I said to all of them, I'm going to do this. You know, I'm going to fly on that one day. And they started laughing at me. And it became a quest. I just had to see what it was like to fly in space. And so... You know, here's a, an example of perseverance, and I think part of that came from my history of sports. Um, I applied to be an astronaut, didn't get even an interview. Two years later, I applied again, didn't get an interview. Then the Challenger disaster occurred, mm. and I thought, I'll never go because maybe no one else, at least what I was, a payload specialist, which is a scientist that flies, I'll never get another chance. And turned out, started flying again. But during all those flights, I kept putting up my experiment. It was doing so well. We were growing unbelievably better crystals that, you know, I got a pretty high priority as a scientist. I published a lot of this work. So I got well known. And finally, I got an interview. And, and, and so when you do an application, um, is it just what I assume it might be is you just your name and your what you what your requirement you know where you've worked and why you want to be yes. an astronaut it's your resume it's your resume so yeah. it's just like every every yeah. other kind of application yeah. so for a payload special it's a little different than for a person that wants to be a career astronaut mm -hmm. so a payload specialist is a scientist usually usually from a university that has been doing space experiments for many years like I had and and you know they apply to perform their experiment in space. The problem is you have to compete. Hmm. And so there were 31 experiments. Hmm. Each of the professors at 31 different universities and some were at some of the NASA bases doing science, they each get one vote. Oh, okay. And so there were 60 nominees. So getting nominated is the first key. And once you're nominated, they look at your resume and they narrowed it down to 12. And those 12 are selected to go take a three-day physical because if you're not healthy, you're not going to get selected. Right. And so I went to Johnson Space Center, took this three-day physical, and I passed. Were you in, were you in how good a shape were you? Were you I in was excellent in, shape? I was 145 pounds, and knowing that the, the, you know, uh, the, the three-day physical was going to come once I was selected, I started running six miles was, a day. I was going to ask yeah, you, prepared? Yeah, you worked because out? Because I knew you... stress test was part of it. They, mm -hmm. they, you know, the stress test, they make you run till you're about to drop. Um, but then they look at other things like, are you claustrophobic? So they have a thing called the life support sphere. It's a big ball, but you have to get in the fetal position to get in it. And you have electrodes 
on your body. And if you sweat too much or your heart rate, you know, goes up too much, you know, you're kicked out of the program. And so I had to stay in there for three hours. And during that time I fell asleep. So I didn't have a problem with being claustrophobic, (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) but so there were different aspects like that to, you know, but once uh, there were two people that failed, I'll, I'll say, I think it's okay to say this. I won't say who, but one person failed the the psychiatry exam mm, yeah. and you would wonder why, you know, cause these are all bright people, you know, and, and, uh, it turned out he had gone through a divorce just mm. recently, and the psychiatrist said, how do you feel about your former wife? And his answer was, I still love her. I didn't want the divorce. That was the worst thing you could say, yeah. because we're going to go through two years of intensive training, and they don't want someone emotionally thinking about that. Sure. You know? So anyway, you never know. We just tell the truth and hope it all works out. Right, because they it, might not have belonged in space. Yeah, yeah. You know, it might yeah. not have been their job. Yeah. But anyway, so then I came back, and now those 31 scientists get in a semicircle and you're in a chair in the middle and they grill you about their science. Now the questions, there were 12 of us, they get grilled, 10 of us, two failed the physical, but the questions aren't hard, but they want to know, does this person know what I do? So I had to go study combustion, fluid dynamics, all these other areas that I didn't normally do um, and make sure that they knew that I was aware of what they've been doing in science. And you had to do all this while you were, I'm assuming, doing another job oh, yeah. to put food on yeah. the table. Oh, yeah. I was still writing proposals, trying to get my research funded because I didn't know if I'd get selected. Um, but anyway, they narrow it to two people and we had to compete those two people for one year. So that first year, you go to each of those universities. Now they take you in a classroom and they tell you about the theory behind their research. And then you go in the lab and you do it. They film what you're doing to see who they think does a better job. And then at the end of that year, you have another exam, oral exam. And that one for me and my my opponent lasted four hours. Um, So now they can ask you about the theory, more difficult questions. And at the end of that day, they vote. And the one with the most votes gets to fly, and the other person has to keep going. He's the backup. Wow. And so, you know, I learned when you watch these beauty contests, Miss America or whatever, and they all smile and say they love each other, don't believe it. You know, the person I competed with, we weren't speaking to each other at the end of that year. It was that contentious. And uh, But then they have to back you up. Yes. And so... Did you for, watch over your shoulder to make for, sure? For three, for three months, <laughs> yeah. NASA kept us apart. Yeah. Because they knew it didn't go well between us. Yeah. And then we had to get together because he's in mission control. He's the only other person that knew the 643 malfunction procedures we had to learn. And many of them, we wrote the procedure for all these experiments. Yeah. And so he's in mission control. He's got to support me while I'm up in space. And he did his job. And the good answer to this story is it was about Three years later, the related mission came up with the same experiments, and he applied again, and now I had a vote. I was one of the scientists with a vote, and I made sure he got selected, (laughs) and and he flew, and we're best friends today. that's great. What a great great story. Great great ending. Doesn't always end that well, but it did for us. I bet. I bet. You know, we just, you know, we both wanted it so bad. Oh, of course. You can imagine. Think about working that hard for something. Yeah, yeah. Now, what was it like when you found, how, how did you find out? That you were going and and yeah. At the know, end of that day, I'm I'm in a uh, airport, and you know back then we had a pretty big cell phone. Oh sure, I get a call. Yeah, and they told me I'd been selected. And right in the airport, that's the second time in my life I cried. Oh, I can imagine. So it meant that much. Yeah, I never would have done it again if I had not won. I I, don't, I wouldn't have gone through that a second time, and I didn't want the person that you know, I competed with to have to go through it. And I made the speech of my life to the other uh, scientists. And I said, don't make him compete for a year. He knows all these procedures. We did it together. Just select them right now and then find a young person that would love to be the backup. And that's what we did. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's the way I think NASA did it from then on. Yeah. That way you don't have that that difficulty trying to work together. How many, <laughs> so. how many people do you suppose... Uh, back up and then finally do get to go into space. Is it a common occurrence or? No, I know of about two or three that were backups and then several years later uh, ended up getting selected. But usually 
they don't get to go, you know, so they never even try again. <laughs> so a lot of times when, a lot of times when you are trying to achieve something and it happens, then it's done. But for you in that case, it's just beginning, right? Yeah. I mean, from that point on, then yeah. the real work begins. So yeah. what happens, what so happens then next? then after that, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I had to move my family to Houston. NASA lets you choose a home. I can't be real fancy, but, you know, I had three children. And so we had a three three or four bedroom home. So it was nice, nice place. And so I live in Houston, but I every once in a while we go back to Marshall Space Flight Center to just refresh all the science that we've learned with the flight hardware uh, or flight-like hardware. Um, but what we're learning in Houston is all about the space shuttle, all about the, the rocket that lifts us into space. And so I had to learn about the mainframe computers of the space shuttle, which is 1960 technology. We even had, I don't know if you're familiar with a PDP-8, well, I had to put a ticker tape into a PDP-8 computer to, wow. to get it to work. And, yeah. what, and what? remind me what year this would have so been. So I, I flew in 92, but okay. the computers, the mainframe computers, they're 60, 1960 technology. Wow. And, and I asked the commander, why don't, you know, all the science computers were the latest the latest, you know, technology. But why for the space shuttle don't they upgrade the software and get new computers? And he said, two reasons. These work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, 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 they accomplish what we want. They get us to space. And the second one is it would probably cost a billion dollars to, to redo everything. So yeah. they just don't. But, but anyway, uh, um, there was a lot of physical training. Um, some of it, you know, I'll never forget. So much fun. Everyone gets a nickname when they fly in space. One of the guys that was, had set all kinds of records uh, in Air Force uh, with experimental jets. And his nickname, I learned why, when I flew with him in T-38s, was Mad Dog Mead. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's amazing. You know, these people can land a jet anywhere, I swear. But, yeah. but my nickname was Which Way? <laughs> because I have no sense of direction. <laughs> and so, and so uh, um, they, as a joke, they actually put a red X over the hatch when we got up in space and it said, Larry, don't open this. <laughs> so, so, but part of the training is we're up on the, on the gantry ready to get in the shuttle. So we're mm -hmm. about 200 feet up. Mm -hmm. And imagine a fire breaks out something. And, and so now we, we need to quickly get out of there. Well, there are these baskets you get in and it's a zip line, and you make your way down. Well, we get in them. It's too dangerous to train that, but we get in it, and then we get back out. They're chained up, okay? But that's what we would normally do. But then once you hit the ground, then what do you do? Because shrapnel, if it's an explosion, could still injure you. Well, there's a U.S. Army tank down there. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn to drive this big Army tank. Mm -hmm. And I got in there with the commander, and I said, where should I go? And he said, Larry, which way? This time, we don't care what direction you go, because this will go there. And so I drove that tank over trees, knocked them right down. I never had so much fun driving an army tank. So, so there were things like that. We had to learn um, all the different types of, of uh, fires you might be exposed to and different ways you would have to put them out. And they actually create those fires. And some of them, I mean, were huge fires on a pond. And we would put them out with, you know, different extinguishers and so forth. Um, you, you, you have to take 14 courses in geography mm -hmm. because we're going to be up there. And part of my job was to photograph parts of the earth. Mm. But anyway, uh, so that was fun. You're, you're learning things I never learned before. And uh, it was very helpful because when you get up there, there's no lines between the countries. You know, nothing's written down there. And you can get very confused what you're looking at. But what's, so. what, what amount of time between when you started that part of the training to when you actually took off? How long of a... So from the time I started the training until we lifted off was two years. It was supposed to be two years. And we were delayed by five minutes from the original launch time and the headline, I don't know if it was the Florida Times or one of the newspapers down in Orlando said, once again, NASA misses launch time. And we were five minutes delayed because of weather. But, you know, negative news is what sells. What sells <laughs> so, yeah. The headline so, writer yeah, added in for you. Yeah. Isn't that um, amazing? So, so, so in the days, <laughs> and I'm curious, like the days leading up, you know, whenever you launch a big project, you're you're kind of jittery and you're focused on that. The days, yeah. what's it like? The days leading up to knowing that you're going to be blasting off into space. You know, I I was so excited about it. If I ever did it again, 
especially on launch, I think I'd try to take in more and remember things because I was studying my job on launch. But really leading, up, leading up to the launch, um, especially when we went into quarantine, you start really thinking about you know what we're about to do. The odds of a space shuttle exploding on launch, I'll tell you the two different odds. One was by the Air Force, one in 26. By NASA, one in 78. NASA turned out to be right. If you look at you know the difficulties, yeah, but yeah. but um, not good odds either way. Uh-uh. And and if you look at what my job was on launch, I'm down in the mid deck, so we have basically no window down there. But I'm looking straight up. You know, you're sitting back on your back, and and right in front of me are the uh, lockers in the mid deck. And there's three very large cue cards on those lockers. And the first cue card tells me what I should do if we explode before 20,000 feet. The next one, if we explode between 20 and 40,000 feet. And the last one, if we explode above 40,000 feet. That's what I was studying right before launch. Man, <laughs> so, that's incredible. So, so, so people ask me, was I nervous? My hands, I was wearing gloves, but they were sweating inside. You know, I'm that nervous about and, the and launch. And I assume you really just in your head, you go through all of, you know, you you prepare for the worst case scenario, what if, and you write notes. And Can't so so they assign an astronaut to each family. And and so I had the, my, the one signed to me. Um, it's no longer an astronaut. He's retired, but he flew several times was Don Thomas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. And, and, you know, he has to help make sure our will's in place and so forth. Um, because I was a payload specialist, I'm not covered insurance-wise by NASA. So I had to get my own insurance. So I got it from Lloyd's of London, the only mm-hmm. place that will insure you. And I got insurance for the time we lift off till right when we touched down. If I had died an hour later, I wouldn't have been covered. And it was a million dollars, and I paid twenty-two thousand dollars for that. Wow, what a what <laughs> an interesting factoid that nobody would <laughs> nobody would ever know that. Yeah, I didn't realize it, but my the president of my university didn't tell me, didn't tell my wife, but he took out the university did a mm-hmm. million dollars for my wife if I had, had you know not come back. Right and. Uh, Probably if she had known now, she could be $2 million richer. Ooh, I don't know what she <laughs> might do. But anyway, anyway, I have that that whole policy frame that the university gave me. It's yeah. really funny to show people. But that's the only place you could get it is from Lloyd's of London. And uh, so there was, a moment, there was a moment at which you knew you weren't going to explode at any thousand feet. Was, yeah. that, was that a relief? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and when we get up there... You know, you're being squished into your seat. It's not a huge, it's not like in the centrifuge. I'll tell you that story too. But in the centrifuge, you know, we can go a lot faster just to see how tough we are. Mm -hmm. But for the space shuttle, you're getting about three, 3.2 Gs. Mm -hmm. And so it is sustained and you're Mm -hmm. strapped down real tight and your oxygen bottles aren't supported. So they're hanging. So now multiply that weight by three times. And so it gets hard to breathe. So everyone just struggles to breathe the last four or five minutes. So the whole flight from launch to get to orbit takes eight for me took eight minutes and 43 seconds and then you go from being squished in your seat and they turn off the main engines and you know you just want to come right out of your seat and for a few people things come out of them Uh, Uh, i i don't get sick I didn't get sick. In fact, I gained three pounds in my 14-day mission, which they said is really unusual because almost all astronauts lose weight. Um, But for some reason, I just, you know, I used to scuba dive way out on the ocean. And uh, people would be sick on these little houseboats. And I I had another nickname, and that was from from my scuba diving year. They called me the Twinkie Man because I loved Twinkies, and I'd be eating (laughs) Twinkies, and people were were barfing (laughs) on the boat, you know. So so I just don't know why, but I don't get sick. So you, you, at some point, they turn the engines off, and does it sound, is it very quiet? Is there a hum? Yeah, as soon as they turn the engines off, there are some a few things running, so you, you hear a very gentle hum. You know, sound is very important on, on the space station, especially where you're up there for three months. So you can almost hear a little bit of the air coming through there. Mm-hmm. You multiply that by 15 machines, mm-hmm. and that surpasses what legally your ears should be mm-hmm. exposed to for a three-month period. Mm-hmm. And so the, the acoustic you know, requirements when you build hardware mm-hmm. are re- 
I, I'm sorry, they're ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, we built an incubator, my engineers, and it had to be looked at by the NASA safety people. And this uh, team comes to my university and uh, the incubator sitting on a table and he said, okay, turn it on. And I said, it is on. <laughs> and he said, really? And then they do all this tests and we failed and we had to get a waiver to fly it. But mm -hmm. you couldn't even hear it if you were standing up. Yeah. But it's because if you multiply that by 20 of them, yeah. you know, over a three month period, it can damage your hearing. Huh. So is is there a moment when when that you know that hum and you finally all encounter each other you know it, where you just like go Whoosh, we made it you yeah. know is yeah. there that moment no where I, I don't, we, there's none of that especially you know career astronauts yeah. if you say to them were you afraid on launch most of them are gonna say oh no oh, so they're you real know? cool but about I, yeah, it. yeah yeah especially the pilots you yeah. know I mean it's this this they thing. just they they knew they were gonna yeah. have that moment yeah. so. so let me tell you about the centrifuge because yeah, yeah. I always tell people I'm the wrong stuff so after my mission it was about a year later I got asked by the administrator of NASA to be the chief scientist for the International Space Station what we have up there right now. Mm -hmm. Back then, we didn't have it, but we were starting to build it. And so I ended up accepting that position. So I lived in Washington for almost two years. And at that time, John Glenn was a senator. And, you know, I would go see him. And then we went to dinner one time. And I decided I got to compare notes, what he did and what I did. Because in the centrifuge, I did real well. I got up to 8.3 Gs. And at that point, it had squished all the blood out of my retina, so I was totally blind. Everything was black. And, you know, they give you this little thing. You push the button when you can't take it anymore. And, you know, I wanted to be number one on my crew. I'm very competitive. And so I was starting to pass out, and they're watching on a camera. My mm -hmm. head was starting to go, and so they stopped it. But I got to 8.3 Gs. I think mm -hmm. it ended up second on the crew. Mm -hmm. But I said, what'd you do? And he didn't want to hurt my feelings, but he said, well, I, actually, Larry, I set the record for NASA. It was <laughs> 16 Gs for 40 seconds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's why, why I tell, he, that's so, why he could handle Washington. Yeah, right. But I tell people I'm the wrong stuff, <laughs> so I could never have done that. At eight G's, I didn't look human. You know, they show you a video of you after, yeah. and I didn't look good at all. <laughs> did you so, Did you like uh, working and living in Washington? I I loved the science. I got to learn the science from all the countries. At that time, there were 13 countries that were going to be part of the space International Space Station. So I had to travel, you know, to all these countries and meet with their scientists. And and uh, I loved that. I hated having to go and talk to congressmen about why they have to pass the next year's budget for mm -hmm. the space station. I felt like a puppet doing that. You sure. Know? I believe we needed one. You right. know, I, I love what NASA is doing. And, and uh, if I were head of NASA, I'd be doing some more things that I think would be exciting. But, um, um, you know, I just didn't like, you know, going up there and, you know, kind of convincing someone to, to give us another, you know, 50 million or 40 million for sure. some project where it's going to be part of the, the space politics station. politics. Yeah. It. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's that. all about, and you see this today, you know, the way you approach a congressman or a senator is let me tell you about some constituents in your district that are working on a NASA project because that's votes. Yeah. And that's what means something yeah. or, or something that gets them in their heart. Like if a family member had diabetes, you know, and we're working on, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I just felt, you know, funny doing that. Yeah, um, but, that's understandable. Yeah, but but um, anyway, it, it was a wonderful experience. If it wasn't for that and the fact that my family didn't want to move to Washington, yeah, I was going to ask you if they every came weekend with you. I flew back to Birmingham because your and, kids were in school, yeah, and yeah. and I wonder if it did did your decision to let them stay back have anything to do with the fact that you had to change school so much as a kid that you didn't want to put them through the same kind of thing. I understood, and yeah. my son wasn't on a basketball basketball team. He was on the tennis team and I know what it's like. And he was on the swim team, you know, and I, I, yes, absolutely. I, I didn't, if they said, no, we don't want to go, you know, getting them to go to Houston till they got there and they got to go in the flight simulators and everything, uh, they were about to shoot me, you know, yeah. they didn't want to go, you yeah. know, all their friends were in Birmingham. Yeah. So, but then once they got there, it all changed. Now, so. now during your mission, um, did anything go crazy? Were there scary moments? Yeah. Or, you, you would know. think with two years of training, you know, you'd know everything, right? So here I am. I not only have a PhD in biochemistry, I'm an eye doctor. You know, I'm an optometrist. And so the first night, 
I had to go to sleep. You know, I was on the day shift. We worked on a day and a night shift. There were four of us on the day shift, three on the night shift. So as soon as we got there, I go to work. And, and I did my job. And now after 12 hours or so, it's time to go to bed. And for a long mission, and we set the record on the shuttle at that time, we stayed up 14 days. They have little, it's like a coffin, it's a box. And you get in, you can shut the door. So I got in there and I shut the door. Well, now you're in total darkness. Well, without an atmosphere, little particles, protons, muons, they go right through the hull of the shuttle and they hit your retina and it creates all these colored sparks. Mm. And so I got in there, I saw all these flashes of light and sparks and I opened the door and I said, I just detached my retina. And they all started laughing at me because it's normal. You know, you don't see it with the light on because it bleaches enough of your retina that you don't see it. But as soon as you get in the darkness, you know, it's, it's like fireworks. Wow. And as an eye doctor, I just knew it was a detached retina. So there was that, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, here I am, an amateur astronomer, and I look out the window, I don't know, it was about the fourth day, and, and I said, Dick, and to my commander, what's that? And he looks at me, he said, I thought you're an astronomer. And I said, I am. He said, well, that's the moon. <laughs> and I said, no way. You know, you have this big ball, the earth. It's yeah. 255 miles below you. The moon's 240,000 miles away. It's an optical illusion. It makes, your, it makes the moon look like a little tiny planet. Huh. I, I thought that can't be the moon. It looks so small. It's just fooling your brain. Yeah. You know? And so that was one time the commander just shook his head. <laughs> you know, when he sees me now, he always shakes his head because of all the silly things that happen like that. But there was another time I said, okay, Dick, you got to come up to the flight deck. And he goes, now what? And I said, I know you're not going to believe me, but there's an alien craft out there. And he comes up there and I said, you look at that light. It's not moving the way all the stars are moving. And he said, Larry, it's the Russian space station. Oh, <laughs> so, wow. So, so, yeah. so and uh, probably the funniest thing that happened was, you know, back then we couldn't talk um, um, via a cell phone to, to your family on the ground. The way I, it was either a fax or, or uh, a ham radio. And so my dad got with a ham radio operator in Birmingham, and we didn't go over the United States, but just a couple times because of the inclination of our orbit. And so we were going to go over Alabama, and I'm, I'm in the, 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 the area where we do the science. You know, we had a big payload area. It's a big, long tube. Um, but anyway, the commander on the mic says, Larry, quick, get up to the flight deck. We're about to go over Alabama. And so I had to go through this tunnel. I float up to the flight deck, and I didn't think, what am I going to say? Mm -hmm. You know, unlike Neil Armstrong, I had nothing planned, <laughs> right? And so, so he says, here, quick, quick, because you only have like 20 seconds, you know, mm -hmm. talk. And I said, hi, Dad, I'm in space. <laughs> and my commander's just shaking his head. And on the ground, my father's doing the same thing. You know? <laughs> so, so you won't see those words in a book anywhere. <laughs> but, Although, but, have you written a book yet about your adventures? That's what you could you Everyone could title tells it, me it would be a comedy, but yeah. I should. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that would yeah. be great. Yeah. When the time, when the, the mission is drawing near the conclusion and you guys are headed back down to Earth, what is the differences between that and takeoff? So the hardest part of spaceflight is not the takeoff, it's the landing. And so you stay in space 14 days, and what, what makes your heart beat harder if you stand up versus you bend over are little baroreceptors in your blood vessels. They send a signal to your heart when you stand up. We, we got to get blood to the brain so we don't pass out, and the heart beats a little harder to get that blood up there. Well, when you stay in space 14 days, that mechanism shuts off. And now you start coming back to Earth. Gravity, you know, you're starting to pick up Gs. It pulls that blood down to your legs. And my heart didn't know what to do. And so I knew it's the only time I felt sick, mm. the whole mission. And I, I, I knew something's wrong. And I looked down at my monitor. It tells me my heart rate and my blood pressure. So I'm just sitting in this chair. And the first time I looked down, my heart rate was right around 150, just sitting in the chair. My blood pressure was 188 over 138. Wow. And I had sweat coming off me, yeah. and I'm swallowing because I felt like I was going to throw up. And I looked up, and I thought, that can't be right. And I looked down again. Now my heart rate was like 85. My heart would race real fast and slow, race real fast. It was all confused. The bear receptors were giving it mixed signals. And so once we touched down... It took, 
30 minutes for me to get out of my seat that long. You, I was supposed to be the first one to stand up. Mm-hmm. And up on the flight deck, I get the signal from the commander, Larry, are you ready to stand up? I said, Dick, I'm just trying not to throw up. And then the guy next to me said, well, I'm getting up. Well, he got up and fell on top of me. You feel like an elephant. You don't think you can even lift your arm. And now he's laying on me. He couldn't get up. And this was 30 minutes after we landed, right? And now the hatch opens. And who comes in? John Young and Crippen, the two people that flew the first space shuttle. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, Crippen looked at this guy in my lap, laying in my lap, (laughs) and he just said, I'm not going to (laughs) ask. But I actually had to crawl out of the shuttle, and then two people grabbed both sides of my arms and helped me up and helped me in. Because if you just turn your head, everything's spinning. If you tip it like that, it's flipping like this. And I had a so here's a great story, so, something I wish NASA would take more advantage of, but I had a theory why astronauts get sick. Mm-hmm. So if you go in a, a, a classroom and you say, how many people here get sick when you read a book in a car? Almost everybody's going to say yes. And the reason is a car is vibrating, even on a smooth road, and in your ear is your crystals that gives you your, your sense of balance. Well, those crystals are bouncing different ways. They're connected to sets of nuclei that are connected to your extraocular muscles of your eye. So what your eye is doing is your eyes are fluttering, but in different directions. You can't see it. You need a microscope. It's called a micro saccade. But anyway, that's what it's doing. And because it's not in the same direction, it's like that, because the crystals are bouncing all over, it's called a disjunctive movement. And that will make most people sick. If you patch one eye, and when I did this, I took 12 trainers from Huntsville in a van. We drove all the way uh, to Cape Canaveral. I patched all of them, and they all said they'd get sick if they read you know, in a car. None of them felt sick, no one. Then we went to that centrifuge, and you know it's a swinging bucket, so you go out like that, so you're taking the Gs, not head to toe, but into your chest. Well, now when it comes down, okay, everything's flipping. You close one eye, it's all normal, completely normal. So I wanted everyone to wear an eye patch on launch because, you know, and they wouldn't do it because they said we won't have good stereo vision, all this. But one person that always got sick when he flew in space, they let him as a medical procedure wear an eye patch, got up there and he got sick as can be. So then I thought, okay, maybe this isn't right. Well, now we're coming home. And gravity, again, is pulling crystals that have been floating in space back down because of gravity and everything's flipping. You close one eye and it's all normal. Our pilot was a rookie. He had never flown before. And his only job, he doesn't land the, the, the spacecraft, the commander does, but his job is to lower the landing gear right before we touch down. It's about 300 feet above the ground. He has to push a button to lower it. That's all. And all of a sudden, I can hear what they're saying. I'm not supposed to talk, right? This is a critical time. But the pilot says, Dick, when I turn my head, the whole instrument panel is spinning. And the commander said, well, don't turn your head. And I wasn't <laughs> supposed to talk, but I'm down in the mid-deck like this with one eye closed and nothing spins. And I pushed the button. I said, Ken, close your eye. And he did. And it worked, stopped all the spinning. So NASA said, you need to tell this to the whole astronaut corps. So 100 astronauts are in this auditorium. And I told that whole story. And then right at the end, Mario Runco is a famous astronaut. He looks just like Spock. You should look him up. He plays, <laughs> Sp- he plays Spock at, at Halloween. But anyway, <laughs> Ma- Mario stood up and said on his mission coming in, everyone had vestibular problems except him, but his job was to film the reentry through the camcorder, and he had one eye closed. Oh, yeah. So there's yeah. something to it. You what know? if that helps with car sickness, too? Oh, yeah. It does it? Yeah. Because my, my wife my, gets car my, sick. My younger brother gets sick at amusement parks. Uh-huh. We went on a – we took him – we got a blind date for him, went on a went – on a, a, you know, a ride with him and he got sick as can be. Right. So then it was about three years later, five years later, when I figured all this out, it was with my NASA training. I thought about all this and uh, I told him, you know, wear an eye patch and let's see if you can do it. He had no problem at all. I'm going to get so, my wife to try it the next yeah, time we go on a trip. You can't wait till you feel sick. You got yeah, to do it from the, the beginning. beginning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to, and cruise ships. Yeah. She gets really sick yeah. on cruise ships. No, I, I think it, I didn't know it back when I used to scuba dive, but I think yeah. it would have helped those people. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. So, so you're very much still involved in, in, you know, after that you were still involved in space and obviously you're connected, you know, forever to NASA and space exploration and what, what, 
do you hope and wish for for space exploration and for NASA, you know, in the near future and in the long term future? So I think I think what NASA's you know goal is now is to one day, not going to happen anytime soon, go with people to Mars instead of robots. The first step will be go back to the moon and actually live there. Why, why is that? Because the moon has about one-sixth the gravity that we have. And with one-sixth the gravity, we don't know how fast will your bone lose calcium, how fast will your muscle deteriorate. Mm. And we need to understand how much we need to exercise with intermittent gravity because Mars has about a third the gravity of the Earth. And, you know, when I was chief scientist of the International Space Station, again, we hadn't built it yet, but we were starting to build it. I felt the most important facility wasn't what I did, protein crystals. It was a human centrifuge. And it was going to cost over a billion dollars to put that up there, and it got canceled. And, I, and the reason is I knew we need to understand how much maybe just a sixth of a G will mean we only need to exercise 20 minutes a day. You know, we don't know. Um, so we, ha we have centrifuges for mice up there, but nothing for humans, and it's not the same. So, so you know, unfortunately, we don't know that, and the moon will help us learn some of that, uh, even learn about growing plants, because we're going to have to grow food on the trip to Mars and then when we get to Mars. And so we'll learn more about how we can one day go to Mars by first going back to the moon. But if I were head of NASA, my highest priority would be to build three telescopes on the surface of the moon, separated by hundreds of miles. And then you combine the image with a technique called interferometry. With that kind of capability, it will dwarf anything we could ever see with the one Hubble that's in space. Mm -hmm. We could see, I think, planets near the edge of our galaxy. If we really want to look for life elsewhere, that's the way I think to do it. Um, so that's what I would love. Why hasn't that been done? I was going to be the <clears> question. <throat> the cost. Yeah, yeah, the cost of doing it. Yeah. But we're going to go back to the moon. We're yeah. going to live there. Maybe one day we'll do that because, you know, you could try to put the telescopes not on the surface of the moon but in space, but then they'd have to be really synced to yeah. get the images all working together. Yeah. It'd be much easier to do it on the moon where there's no atmosphere and you could do this. Um, so that would be what I'd like to see if I were head of NASA, but I know because of costs, that's why it hasn't been done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. and um, just like you said, having to go in and talk to the senators and you know pitch for money and you know it is uh, unfortunate, but that would be great. Yeah. Um, I know one thing is as space travel becomes more... Um, frequently done, you don't hear about it as much. You know, you don't hear about it unless there's something, unless something goes wrong. I know just yesterday there was a spe another, like the second all female crew yeah. space did wall, the space you know, but yeah. you barely yep. saw it on TV. You barely yeah. heard about it. You know, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. it's interesting that, you know, it's become mundane. Yes. People take it for granted. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's sad, but, you know, I, I also have told NASA for 25 years, uh, why don't we fly a poet or a writer? Because people like myself, I, I don't really know how to let you feel the emotion and what it's like to look down at Earth and look at the stars. And I, here I was, an amateur astronomer. I couldn't find the Big Dipper up there. Everywhere you look, it's just the thousands of stars. There's no wow. atmosphere. You know, it's just yeah. just an amazing view. Um, and someone, you know, could probably you know, make people understand emotionally what it's like to to look at you know our world and and beyond from from that kind of perspective. Um, but I think again, because of the risks of spaceflight, that hasn't happened. I'm hopeful with all these commercial groups, it's going to happen. Yeah, I was going to ask future. you about that. So yeah. 2020. Is supposed to be the year yeah. um, that they're taking tourists into space. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. I yeah. mean, that'll certainly um, that'll make news. Yeah. And so we'll oh, yeah. once again be reminded. Yeah. Um, you haven't had a chance to go through our um, astronaut exhibit um, yet, I don't believe. But have you been to it when it's been in any other cities? Um, 
So, of course, I spent a lot of time at the Huntsville Space and Rocket Center. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I do a lot of STEM education there with adults and children. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then in Birmingham, there is a, a, a Challenger Center there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm familiar with a couple of places in Houston also. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here at Discovery Park and on our podcast. And on behalf of all the uh, people who are being touched by you being here, we really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I've been impressed from what I've seen. I can't wait to see the rest of it. It's it's uh, really impressive what you've put together. And I actually learned quite a bit going through some of the exhibits myself that I, I you know, probably I learned it somewhere back in, in my days, but I, I didn't remember a lot of what I've, I've learned just looking at it. So I think it's it's uh, a wonderful facility education-wise. Excellent. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. And now let's go find out a little bit more behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. Hey everyone, I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today I am with Russell Orr, Education Specialist here. And today he's going to be talking to us about astronauts, space, and how exactly they move. Russell, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Lots of... uh Lots of, lots of good things going on today. So I, I brought something to our, our, our podcast here. Uh, I got some canned air right here. You know, we use this to clean the keyboards. Well, if I had done that and we were in microgravity, that air rushing outward would have been enough to push me across the room. Remember, in microgravity, you weigh next to nothing. So if you blow blow on something, if you... Ex, if you uh, push something away from you, well, Newton's third law, every action equals an, has an equal and opposite reaction. Normally, air moving isn't enough to push you around. But in space, this little can of air would act like a miniature rocket and slowly accelerate me around the room. This is actually another reason why fire is dangerous in space. Because if you got a fire extinguisher and you point that fire extinguisher at the fire and start spraying a compressed substance at it, what's going to happen to you? You're going to blow against the wall. Yeah, you're going to get pushed away from the fire. A less scary thing is uh, if you're out of the spaceship, we'd call that extravehicular activity in a good old NASA lingo. One of the things that you could do is if you had bottled air like this, you could spray it behind you and push yourself forward. So some of the uh, tools that astronauts use to get around, uh, I believe one of them is called SAFER, the Simplified Aid for Extravehicular Rescue, has essentially compressed air in it. And the astronauts maneuver the jets around in order to propel themselves around the space station and whatnot. Uh, But tethers, uh, the little ropes, uh, those are also employed too. You know, keep it simple. Be safe. So on those on those little jet packs or you know yeah. whatever you it's want to call not it. I, 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 on those little safer packs on those on those safer packs. Do you know about poundage of pressure is being exerted from those or? If I had to guess, and remember, I don't know. I would assume that it would just be a little bit, not a whole lot. You don't want to lose control in space. You don't want to overshoot your your destination, whether that's the safety of the airlock or, you know, your friend who needs your help. I would, because remember, you just need, even if it's just a little bit, if I keep on pushing it, it's going to slowly accelerate me faster and faster. There are even designs in progress that slowly accelerate spacecraft over a very long time, but all that energy builds up into quite a bit of velocity. So if you just had, if I had an unlimited can of air, and just held it down for years at a time in outer space, I could be going tens of thousands of miles an hour by the end. of by the end. And then when I got to my destination, I might want to take another can and spray it the other direction to stop myself. There are ion drives and all kinds of different things uh, that, that NASA is looking at in order to propel our spacecraft around. Let me ask you something. I know that we have the... Uh, uh, good old astronaut exhibit here from SciTech. Did you interview one of the astronauts? I did not, but I got to listen to him. You got to listen to him. Did he talk about what happens when you sneeze in space? He didn't. Well, I just, like, I don't know, but I just wonder because, right, you know, if you blow air away from you, it pushes you back. So if you sneeze in space really, really hard, do you do a backflip? 
I don't know, but we'll save that question for another <laughs> podcast. Or maybe some of you listeners at home can solve that for us. Uh, we hope you discovered something new today. I know I certainly did. Um, for all of our listeners, as you're listening to this, whether it be your car or at home, look around and see if there's anything that might act a little quirky that could be used uh, to help aid movement in space. Uh, one more little thing before we go. You can learn more about space at Discovery Park of America. Thank you all for listening. We hope to see you here real soon. And get on tight. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.